So we're happy to have Nicole Gonzalez from UCLA tell us about a skin theoretic Carlson Mellet algebra. Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, thank you for being here. Um, so, um, and thank you for inviting me. This is, this is great. I'm very excited to tell you this. Um, so I'm trying a new program today, so I apologize if it's a little bit, if I end up having weird writing problems, but hopefully we'll get through it together. Um, okay, so what I want to tell you about today um, is, as the title says, a skein theoretic cross and melon algebra. And um, this is all joint work with your very own Matt Hogan camp. So if you have any questions, you can just ask him. <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, so uh, in any case, so the plan for today is I want to tell you um, basically an algebraic story. Um, and this is, this is kind of the original story. This is a story due to Carlson and Mellet. Um, let's write, this is the original story. And then I'm going to tell you a topological or skein theoretic story. Right, um, and this is uh, joint with Matt, um, right, where we're gonna basically translate this whole story to topology. Um, and then uh, hopefully I'll have time to tell you a categorical, categorical story. And so these last two parts, um, this is all joint with Matt. Cool, okay. So let me tell you a little bit of uh, the motivation behind this pro this problem, um, just so that we're kind of, you know, uh, I understand that people who probably have never heard of this Carlson metal algebra are wondering why on earth we would even care to make it skein theoretic. Um, so I'm gonna start telling you a little bit about some things that you potentially have heard about. So there are these uh, McDonald polynomials, um, right? They arise in, uh, combinatorics, they arise in representation theory and algebraic geometry. So these polynomials seem to be everywhere. Uh, and somehow uh, they're part of the reason that they show up everywhere is because they're somehow these master functions that specialize to everything. So if you care about sure functions, right, if you care about uh, representations of GLN or the symmetric group, then you're inevitably going to end up with sure functions showing up. And those are just special cases of McDonald polynomials. If you care about Hall Littlewood polynomials, Jack polynomials, so all these really important families all come from McDonald polynomials. Um, and it turns out um, that about in 2001, um, in 2001, Hagland realized these, maybe I have the date wrong actually, question mark. Uh, uh, not Hagland, sorry, Heyman. Um, Heyman uh, constructed these modules. He called them Garcia, mo Garcia Heyman modules. Um, and he showed that these McDonald polynomials arose as Frobenius characters of these Garcia Heyman modules, right? So these were bigraded SN modules, right? And then um, you know, he's like, well, this is maybe not good enough, so we're going to construct an even more general vector space. And motivated by these Garcia Heyman modules, he actually showed that they arise inside a much bigger space, um, right? So this is, uh, let's say, the Frobenius character. This is you get from here to here. So then he constructed a bigger space, which he, um, which is called the space of diagonal harmonics. Right, and this space is kind of a, a nasty, a nasty looking space if you just look at the definition. But essentially, this is really just you look at polynomials in two uh, sets of variables. So when I say xn and yn, I mean variables x1 through xn and variables y1 through yn. So Double a double set of variables, um, and such that the um, sums of all partial derivatives, so um, x to the k and y to the j of f is zero. All right, so you basically have all partial derivatives are zero, and this is the space of diagonal harmonics. Okay. Um, and what uh, Hagland, or sorry, ha Heyman again showed is that if you take the Frobenius character of this space, this much bigger space of diagonal harmonics, you get something that's known as nabla en. So here, nabla is this operator that if you're not familiar with symmetric functions, you've probably never heard of. So this is called the nabla operator. Um, and it was 
uh, invented or I guess discovered by uh, Garcia and Bergeron. And the reason it shows or people care about it is because somehow it shows up everywhere in symmetric function theory in algebraic common tricks. Anything you try to do somehow this novel operator or everything can be expressed in terms of this novel operator. And it's one defining property is that it has uh, these McDonald polynomials as eigenvalues. Old polynomials as um, eigenfunctions. Not eigenvalues, sorry, eigenfunctions. Right. Um, and then EN here is just your nth elementary symmetric function. All right. So this was all, you know, really exciting in algebraic combinatorics. People were really happy because it turns out this, these were, you know, big open questions for a while. Um, and the way that uh, Heyman proved this was using Hilbert schemes. Right. So even though these are algebraic problems or sorry, combinatorial problems, um, he used the geometry of Hilbert schemes to prove this. Um, so then this brought upon a whole new prop, new question, which was, well, it's great. You know, he told us that what the Frobenius characters of these things are, but it would be nice as combinatorialists if we had a combinatorial description. And what that means is basically, can we write this, um, this expression right here, this nabla en, as a sum over some sort of symmetric function indexed by some sort of combinatorial statistic. Like, can you count numbers in a tableau? Are you indexing by tableau? Are you indexing by fillings? Something like this. Um, and that question became known as the shuffle conjecture. So basically the shuffle conjecture is the um, search uh, for a combinatorial formula for uh, this uh, NABLA EN, right? Now, uh, when I say search, really, it wasn't a search for very long in the sense that Hagland, Heyman, and uh, some other people actually came up with a conjecture of what this formula was. Uh, and they conjectured that it was a sum over these things called parking functions. So maybe I should say this was, it was a conjectured in terms of some symmetric functions called parking functions of uh, parking functions. Right. Um, and, but that even, even though they conjectured it, they still, nobody could prove it. Can I ask um, you? Yes. Um, uh, hi, I'm Valerio, by the way, sorry. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi, Nicole. Uh, so, uh, um, about the McDonald polynomials, usually they are eigenfunctions of, uh, of Dunkel operators, right? I mean, so. Yes. What is the relation between the delta nabla en and, and uh, the Dunkel operators? Ah, uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head. I'm sorry. They are related somehow. Matt, do you know by any chance or anybody who do you know, remember the exact relation between the two? Uh, there's a sort of relationship in uh, this paper by uh, DeFrancesco and Kadem. It's very ugly in terms of the Dunkel. Oh, it's not ugly. You can write it down. But it's not like one equals the other or anything simple like that. Yeah. Yeah, you can write it in terms of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. It's, so it's understood, but not nicely. You mean that the, those things are again functions of two sets of, or, or sorry, this is not a set, this is a single operator you're saying. It's a single operator, yes. It's just one single operator. So, and you're saying there's no clean, uh, Joshua, as I understand, you're saying there's no clean explanation for why these uh, functions are both eigenfunctions of a single operator and of a bunch of commuting operators, in the, namely the, the Dunkel operators. No, no, you can write this nabla in terms of the Dunkel operators. Uh -huh. But, but not it's, some kind of Alexander morphism of some kind. I mean, no, no. Uh, yeah, it's like an x above sum of y squares. It's bad. Yeah. Uh -huh. Anyways, uh, whatever. So I, I would also say more gen, more generally, and actually, Josh, maybe you might be the right person to ask about this. Um, I'm sure. You, so there's a whole family of operators, I think, on symmetric functions, um, given by the elliptic Hall algebra. Mm -hmm. And these McDonald, there's a um, like subalgebras of this elliptic Hall algebra corresponding to each slope, each rational slope. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and these uh, McDonald polynomials are eigenfunctions for anything of slope zero or infinity. I forget which. So there's a one parameter family of these, like these. M M Garcia calls them d zero, d one, uh, and so on. And I think the Dunkel operators are, are special cases of these, or at least related. 
but nebula is uh, not an element to the elliptic Hall algebra, but it's closely related. Anyway, sorry, I don't know if that helps. Okay. These are great questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, okay. And so then um, what I was saying is that uh, this conjecture was actually not open for very long, or it was open, I'm sorry, it was open for 15 years. It was open for very long, despite the fact that there was a conjectured formula. So then this became the Schumpel theorem. Um, and this was given in 2015. Uh, it was proven by Carlson and Mellet. And the way they proved it is very interesting because you would think that the fact that it's a combinatorial formula, the proof would be completely combinatorial. Um, but the way they did it is they actually uh, introduced a new algebra, this thing called the Carlson and Mellet algebra, all right? or we're gonna denote the AQT algebra. So they introduced this new algebra um, to actually prove it and you know, okay, I'm not gonna get into the proof. Um, but what's interesting is this, you know, seemingly unrelated algebra, which is morally we can think of basically as two intertwined copies of an affine Hecke algebra. Let's, let me write this. So it's kind of like two intertwined <clears throat> copies of um, an extended affine Hecke algebra. I'll give you the definition in a bit. Um, <clears throat> And it turns out this algebra was actually had pretty cool properties. So the first cool property um, is, well, it was the fact that it actually can be realized um, geometrically uh, using parabolic Hilbert schemes. So somehow, it's not just common torques. There is something deeper going on here, right? And this is work of uh, Gorski and uh, Carlson and Mellet. And then the second very interesting property is the fact that um, in the work of Mellet, where he actually proved an extension of this shuffle conjecture called the rational, rational shuffle conjecture, he showed that the generators of the elliptic Hall algebra actually show up inside of this um, AQT algebra, right? So you can reconstruct it somehow directly from the elements of the AQT algebra. So the generators of the elliptic Hall uh, algebra are basically are inside somehow, and I'm going to put this in parentheses because, you know, that's obviously not um, uh, technically correct, but they're, they're inside AQT. Right. Um, okay, so this is kind of the motivation behind why you would want to study this seemingly, you know, uh, uh, weird algebra that comes out of nowhere or it comes out of a combinatorial problem. Uh, sorry, Nicole, can I ask another connection question? Please, please. Is it, is it related to the double app? So they are related. They are not the same. Uh, the connection is explained and I think one of, uh, I think it's actually in the Carlson Mellet paper uh, on the shuffle conjecture. Um, I don't remember the exact connection. I'm sorry. Um, but they're definitely, they're very, they are related. They are not the same. Yeah. Um, okay. So that was the motivation. This is kind of why uh, you would want to study it. Um, and what I Oh, am I missing a page? Oh, no, I'm not, I'm not, okay. I was concerned that I had uh, missed a page somehow. So in order to um, tell you about this, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on symmetric functions that we're, we're gonna need. So the first couple of ideas that um, I want to recall um, are, the, well, the first idea is the idea of plethysm of symmetric functions, right? We're only gonna need it in one case, but I just want you to have seen it so it doesn't come out of nowhere. Um, so a plethysm for symmetric functions is just a ring extension, right? So of, uh, of an endomorphism, sorry, it's, uh, I'm saying this backwards. A plethysm of a ring extension of the ring of symmetric functions is just an endomorphism that's determined by its action on the power sum symmetric functions, right? And it's normally denoted by square brackets. Um, so I'll point it out again when we actually run into it, but all I want you to know is that basically all that you're doing is if you have a symmetric function f and you want to plethystically modify it by 
whatever is inside. You write this as a as some sort of uh, series, right? You want this as um, to see this as a series, and then you express f into power sum symmetric functions. And then individually substitute each power sum symmetric function in this way. So based on a couple of rules, right, where you basically just replace each variable by each of the um, elements of this power series. So it's annoying and it's a really, really ugly, um, ugly computation. That's the only way I can say it. Um, it's actually very poorly understood in algebraic common works. People don't really know how to, you know, multiply these elements and expand these elements because you basically always have to go back to your power sums to do any sort of computations using this. Um, in particular, we're going to be dealing with this plethysm. So I just want to put it out here. Here, eta, we can just think of as just some parameter. It doesn't matter. Here, epsilon is basically some signed variable. I don't want to necessarily tell you what it is. It's just some plethystic notation for sometimes adding minus signs in specific ways. Um, and all this is plethysm is doing is saying we're going to send the cake symmetric function to itself with this added piece. Okay, so if you know what this is, that's great. If you don't, just black box it. And basically, it's some sort of endomorphism of the ring of symmetric functions that sometimes adds variables and messes with your symmetric functions a little bit. Um, okay. Um, what else do we need to remember? Well, there's the affine Hecke algebra, that just as a, a quick reminder, right? It's generated by a family of TIs and TN minus ones, or sorry, TIs and YIs, right? Your YIs are just your polynomial generators, and then your TIs are just the usual Hecke algebra generators with the usual relations. We will be picking this normalization, um, so that just so that you keep it in mind. Okay, so now with these definitions in mind, let's actually define <clears throat> the first half of this um, AQT algebra that I told you about. So we're going to call it AQ, no T yet, right? So it's this category, right, or it's an algebra. You can think of it as an algebra with um, idempotence if you don't want to think about it as a category. Um, so its objects are integers. And then we can think of the morphisms as being a series of maps. So it has TIs, it has D plus and minuses, and then it has some fees, which are just basically a commutator of this D plus and these D minus operators. Um, and then the TI satisfy the Hecke algebra relations. Then you have some uh, commutation relations between the Ds and the Ts. And then you have some braid absorption relations. And when I say braid absorption, I'm thinking of the TIs as being crossings, which is why I think of them as absorbing braids. Um, I mean, these relations are just long and messy, and I'm just showing you to, for completeness. But really, you don't have to memorize them, and they're not really going to matter. It's just they exist. They define this algebra. It has a lot of relations. Um, OK. Yes, uh, sorry. That, that top one of the great relations should go from n to n plus 2, right? Yes. Yes. Here. No, wait. This is. I'm, uh, I'm Jose. <laughs> Which one did I, did I make a? Uh, the top one of the braid absorption uh, relations. Because oh, you yeah. have D plus twice. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is N, N, N plus two. Yes, thank you. And I think this should be N minus two as well. Uh, yeah. But then the second one should go from, so the, the very top one goes from N to N plus two. The next one from, from N, N to N, N plus one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, sorry. This is, yeah, N to N plus two. Two. Let me just scratch this entire thing. This is n to n plus one. Thank you. This is n to n minus two and n to n minus one. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So it has a bunch of relations. Um, sorry, it's a little definitional heavy at the beginning, but we'll get to some some fun things in a little bit. Um, and then we can also define this extra element y i, which is basically just defined in terms of the previous generators. Um, and the point is that this yi and the tj's basically are generating uh, an affine Hecke al subalgebra, right? And this is why I was saying that you can think of, um, well, in this case, just a, not, not the two versions of it, but just a as being an extension of the affine Hecke algebra 
by these operators um, d plus and d minus, right? Because the fee, if you have y, you don't need the fee, right? There's somehow you can you can pick a different set of generators where you ditch the fee and you just have the y's and the the t's and the d plus and d minus. Um, okay. Um, any questions or comments? Please feel free to butt in. Um, now we can construct basically the same algebra, but now we're going to call it a star, right? This is where the, the other copy that I'm telling you shows up. And it's essentially the same thing, same relations. You can, you know, actually show that they're completely isomorphic. Um, the only difference is that instead of, you know, writing Qs, we're going to write Q inverse. Instead of writing Ts, we're going to write T inverses in the relations. And our um, operators are going to be called Ti inverse instead of T, right? Our D plus is going to become D plus star. D minus stays the same, and phi becomes phi star. But this is really, by itself, just a relabeling of the previous algebra. Exact same thing, just taking two copies, relabeling it so that we can keep track of which copy we're talking about. Um, great. Now we actually have the definition we're hunting for. Um, so what is the Carlson and Mellet algebra? So it's basically you take two, you take the copy of A, you take A, sorry, this is AQ and this is AQ inverse, right? Um, so the, the two uh, algebras that I just defined, you stick them together in the same bag. You say, all right, I want the exact same morphisms. I want the same objects. I want the exact same relations but then you intertwine them, right? You make them interact. You make them interact by adding these three extra relations. So this is what we're gonna call the, um, we're gonna say that if these relations hold, then the copy of A and A star are correctly intertwined. All right, so that's this terminology. Okay, any questions? I realize it's just been definitions, but um, feel free to, to interrupt. Okay. Yeah, no, sorry. I, I, so the, the two algebras share the D minus, but the D pluses are different, right? Well, by abstractly, the D pluses are actually exactly, they're literally the same algebra. It's just, we're just labeling it differently. And we're choosing in the AQT to not make a distinction between the D minuses. Okay, okay. Yeah? I think so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, somehow like in this, in this AQT, we want to distinguish the D plus that came from one and the D plus that came from the other, but we don't want to distinguish the D minus. That's the one thing that we don't want to distinguish from either one. Yeah. Sorry, what was the, was there, what were the relations between D pluses and Y, I? D pluses and Y, I. Where in this, they're in the same algebra. Do we have any relations? Um, ah, they are, they are, yeah, I guess they're right here. Oh, I see. Yeah. So in particular, if you try to commute the yi past the d plus, or you anyway, okay. you pick up a bunch of t's. Okay. You so pick up there, a bunch of t's, yeah. There, so there isn't a relation like the intertwining one when you're living in the same algebra for the. Anyway. Not, not, no, no. The intertwining is actually going to come up later with a different operator. Okay. Um, okay. But thanks. Not, not here. Yeah. Yeah, I can't give you much intuition behind these equations. I wish I, I could, honestly. The relation is just, I mean, it's, I think that they came up with them experimentally by just playing a lot with, with the objects that they were dealing with. Because I don't, somehow you look at this and you're like, in what way is this intuitive? And I, I don't really know. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't give you a better answer. Um, okay, so we have this algebra, satisfy some relations, great. So what do we want to do with it? Well, the first thing we would like is to come up with a representation of this algebra. Um, so this is what's known as the polynomial representation. And again, up to now, this is all work of Carlson and Mellet, right? Um, so what they did is they defined these vector spaces, Vn, and they're really just the ring of symmetric functions with, you know, over coefficients t and q with some extra parameters y1 through yn. Um, and they defined a specific action of AQT on it given in the following way. So the TIs, you want this to, or you want the TIs and the YIs, right, to generate an action of the affine Hecke algebra on this. And what they did is they basically just defined the action of the TIs and the YIs to be the standard action of the affine Hecke algebra you would normally define on this. Where here, 
these are just demajeure operators, right? Or divided difference operators, if you've heard of them. Um, and then this crazy formula are just uh, demajeure elustic operators. So this action, the action by the T and the Y is very classical. You can find it in the work of Lustig. Um, so there's nothing, nothing out of the ordinary there. Um, what is interesting is the way that these extra, right, and this is just multiplication, by the way, this is multiplication by YI. Um, so what is interesting is these extra, what we're gonna call raising and lowering operators, the D pluses, right? So it's these crazy formulas here, this is just saying, all right, we're gonna take F, some symmetric function leaving in here, or some function leaving in here, plethistically modify it somehow, um, multiply it by your elementary symmetric function, stick it in inside this crazy sum, and then take the residue. Um, so this is you know, the sort of definition that kind of makes you wanna pull your hair out a little bit, um, and makes you wonder how on earth they came up with it, really. Um, then you look at D plus, same idea, you do this plethism, you conjugate with TIs, and then the D plus star is almost the same thing. You do the exact same plethism as you did for D plus, but instead of conjugating with the TIs, you conjugate with this endomorphism that essentially just bumps up your Ys. It acts on Y1 and it gives you Yi plus one. So it acts, um, yeah, it just rotates the Ys around. So, um, okay, you have this crazy action and I mean, no surprise, or maybe it's actually kind of a surprise when you look at the definition, that these actions induce an action of AQT on not just each copy of VN, but the full direct sum of them. The reason for that is that the D plus and the D minus, sorry, the, the D plus actually bumps you from one VN to VN plus one. It doesn't stay fixed in the same, in the same copy of VN. And this is why you call it a raising operator, because it's really kind of jumping between the levels. Um, okay. This polynomial action. So up to here, this is um, the big part of uh, the algebraic component. I have a couple of, uh, of of more things to say about this, but any questions? Very well. Um, okay, so this action looks a little bit weird um, and kind of messy, but it turns out that you can actually use it to generate a basis for the vector spaces themselves. And this is a result of Carlson and Mellet, which is basically that if you just act on one in your, in your polynomial, uh, in your symmetric polynomial um, vector space, and you act by these AQT generators, you can actually generate a basis for the space, which is pretty cool. Um, and then you also have um, these other sets of operators that will prove important. Uh, so the first one is we can think of the, this as the standard involution on symmetric functions that sends elementaries and completes and swaps them, right? <clears throat> And it just uh, takes Q and T and inverts those as well. So this is um, just a sta standard function in symmetric function theory. And then we also have this N. So this is uh, an antilinear degree preserving automorphism. And it's uniquely defined by these properties, right? And this is basically just telling you that N is intertwining the actions of A with, um, or AQ, with this AQ inverse, right, inside, um, inside AQT. So it's uh, intertwining these actions, um, right? So the operator N is actually very, very interesting. Um, right, and it turns out that this operator N, when you act on V0, which by the way, if you go back and look at the definition of what is V0, so this, at n equals zero, right, <laughs> v zero is really just the ring of symmetric functions because you have no extra parameters y. So all this is telling you is that when you look at this operator n and you act on the ring of symmetric functions, it's acting like this operator nabla from the beginning conjugated by this uh, standard involution on symmetric functions, right? So, I mean, and this is really not doing much of anything. The standard evolution, basically this is just telling you N and NABLA are essentially the same up to conjugation, but that's neither here nor there. Cool. Okay, now I'm actually done with the algebraic story. Questions before I move on to what seems to be a completely different flavor of mathematics.
It's a lot of definitions and basically a lot of formulas. So I understand it's a little dry. Very well. Um, okay, so what is the topological picture that I want to tell you about? Well, the first thing I want to do is to reinterpret the Hecke algebra uh, in terms of pictures. All right, so this is the skein theoretic component of it. We're going to think of Ti as just being an upward crossing. We're going to think of Ti inverse as just being, um, or not upward crossing, sorry, a positive crossing, and Ti inverse is just um, a negative crossing. And then it's going to be subject to this or just the skein relation right from before, which basically just translates to this picture and the usual braid relations that you would think of, um, right, where you can slide a strand underneath a crossing and that far away crossings commute. So this is, um, you've probably, if you've seen anything related to uh, not theory, you've seen these, this kind of formulation before. Um, and what that tells us is that we can think of HN diagrammatically, right, as just the span of braids up to the skein relation, right? You, so every element inside the Heck algebra is really just realized as a, 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 you know, a, a sum of um, braid diagrams. That's it. Um, and then what that means is that if we want to consider then not HN but its co-center, right, what is it, what we're doing here is we're really just saying, well, let's take an element of HN, it acts on itself on the right, it acts on itself on the left, and we're just gonna identify the left and right action. Well, that's equivalent here, diagrammatically, since acting on the left and acting on the right corresponds to acting on the top and acting on the bottom of the diagrams, to basically identifying the top and bottom, which is equivalent to closing the diagram up. So this is why here, this corresponds to just closing the diagrams, right? on a punctured annual. So this is an annulus, right? There's supposed to be some sort of hole here that you can't just move things through. Um, okay, and again, it's just your D is some braid up to skein relations, but the point is that if you have a crossing here, then you can slide the crossing all the way around to a crossing here, right? Um, good. Um, and it's actually, this, was, this is not new, this is well known, so this is exactly work of Morton and Aston. Uh, where they showed that you can realize symmetric functions in this way, right? That if you take a direct sum of these things, then you actually just get our nice pal v0 back. And under this mapping, elementary symmetric functions correspond to just a bunch of positive crossings, the closure of a bunch of positive crossings. Uh, homogeneous symmetric functions correspond to the closure of a bunch of negative crossings. Sure functions correspond to the closure of uh, these things called young item potents, right? Um, which are elements inside the group algebra of the symmetric group. And in this case, the group algebra of the Heck, or inside the Heck algebra. Um, so, yeah. Um, so the real question here is, we have V0 down, how do we incorporate the Ys? How do we get VK out of this whole, whole story? Um, so what we want to do is instead of performing a full closure on the diagrams, we just want to do a partial closure, right? So here, we're looking at not identifying HM plus N, not everything, but instead really just HM with N plus N, so just part of the closure. Diagrammatically, right, as you would expect, this means we're only closing part of the, of the diagram on the annulus, right? And then um, in addition, for technical reasons, we add the condition that um, if any braid, um, that any braid in this topological VK space that we want to come up with, um, that any braid has to absorb symmetrizers, right? So like I told you, these symmetrizers are just these young item points. They're, they're the same. So this is just um, a young symmetrizer. I use both words interchangeably and I apologize uh, if that's confusing. So these uh, PNs, right, like I told you are just item points inside the Heck algebra. And the condition is that if you conjugate, or if you basically compose one with the other, you don't notice it. It absorbs them, but only from the bottom, not from the top, and really just on these end strands, right? It's a very, very precise condition. Um, what this gives us is the following. So this is, um, maybe I can call it a proposition, since we did have to prove it. Um, so this is a proposition uh, due to Matt and myself that these VNs are really just isomorphic to 
the span of these kind of diagrams, right? Where this is uh, N and this is N. All right, so it's basically just a bunch of diagrams that have N free strands, right? The Ns correspond to the variables Y1 through Yn, right? Because this was just basically symmetric functions that joined Y1 through Yn. So this corresponds to the things that you're adding. And then you take the sum over increasingly many closed um, strands around the annulus, right? And here the condition is that, all right, D is a braid, makes sense. Up to skin relations and isotopy, makes sense. But this condition that it absorbs symmetry from the bottom is precisely this fact right here. Great. Um, so, what do we want to categorify, or sorry, what do we want to realize now is basically just the action itself. We have the players, we have the components. Let's define an action. So how do you define this AQ action on this topological VN space? So we want to realize all these operators. The way we do that, well, first of all, is I'm lazy and I don't want to have to close the diagram every time. So I'm going to just write it like this and I put a little squiggly line on the right saying it closes, whatever. Um, right. And the definitions that we're going to be working with, uh, and these are definitions again that uh, due to Matt and myself, is that we're going to define this operator TI to basically take these diagrams. So it eats a diagram that looks like, like this, and it spits out a diagram that crosses the i and the i plus i and the i plus first strand on top. Right. And TI is basically this positive crossing, or TI inverse, the positive crossing becomes negative. Um, D plus is the operation of basically you take your original diagram, um, you take your original diagram here, and then you just add a strand, right? That's what this purple line is. You are adding a strand, so you're increasing your symmetrizer uh, on the bottom by one. So this QN uh, is really just a multiple of the, the PN that we saw before, this Young symmetrizer. The multiples come for grading for reasons that we want certain equations to hold. But um, morally, you can just really think of this as just a, it's just a symmetrizer, just like we did, we had before. Um, D minus, you take your original image, and then you take the nth strand here, and then you close it, right? That's all this is doing. And then likewise here, you take this. So you're basically just taking this line, this nth strand, and wrapping it around the annulus. Um, yi. And phi also have diagrammatic interpretations. In yi, you take the i strand, you go underneath all its strands to the right, then you wrap it around the annulus, right? Come back, you go under everything, bring it back up, and then you replace it in strand i. But here you're going over everything, and here you're going under, right? This is under. And then phi is basically an analogous kind of construction. But here, instead of taking in phi, instead of taking the i strand, you start with the n plus the n plus, yeah, the n, nth strand, right? Because this would be one and n, yeah. The nth strand, you wrap it around, go under, and then go back up. Um, so you look at these, and all right, maybe if you're not familiar with pictures, it looks a little bit weird. But objectively, and maybe, you know, this is all, I, I shouldn't say this, but this looks a lot cleaner than these plethistic definitions that we had before, um, right? And the amazing part of, of, of these definitions, and this is a theorem, is that these topological operators actually induce an action of a Q on this topological VN, right? So they're realizing the action in operators that are conceptually, I think, much, much easier to, to see and much, much easier to manipulate. Um, okay, um, right, and all this is, basically just telling you is that they satisfy the slew of relations that I, uh, I showed you at the beginning, right? So how would you prove this? Well, the proof is really just purely diagrammatic. Um, how much longer do I have? Uh, you, you end? 21, 22 minutes. 21, okay. Then actually let me, let me show you an example of how you would, um, how you would actually compute such a, how you would prove one of the relations. Um, it's, it's pretty short. So for example, one of the relations in the AQ algebra was the fact that phi composed with D plus is supposed to equal T1 of D plus of phi, right? We're gonna check this by just acting on just an arbitrary diagram. 
So we start with some diagram. Uh, maybe give myself some more space. We start with some diagram D. And what's the first thing I want to do? I want to do a D plus. So this is my diagram D, right? And these are the strands that are sloughing off. So D plus increases and adds this symmetrizer on the bottom, right? That's this part. And then I'm going to do phi. What does phi do? Well, phi takes my last strand, wraps it around, and then brings it back up, right? So, oh, what am I doing? Sorry. Um, so then here, we're going to take this strand here. So maybe let me duplicate this. We're going to take this strand here, wrap it around, and then it comes back under at all the other strands. So it comes back under, whoop, under, 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 and then it comes back to the top. All right, so maybe let me color some of these strands, right? So this strand here is going to be my green strand. Right, that's this one. And here the point is that this is all the closure. Um, okay, and then what about the other side of the equation? What about this side? So here we're starting with our diagram D. And then we're supposed to do a phi. So we do the exact same thing. So we start with this one, we bring it here. This one comes under. So that was phi. And then we do a D plus. D plus adds a space. So this becomes a QN plus one, adds a strand. And then you do a T1. And the T1 is going to cross these two strands here, right? So you look at this and a priority starts, you're like, is this really equal? How possible, how can it possibly be topologically equal? Well, oh, shoot. let's, uh, let's see. So that green strand should correspond to what? It should correspond to the strand here. Hopefully I didn't make any mistakes, so let's see. Great, which we see is exactly what you get if you slide that green strand underneath the symmetrizer here to the bottom is exactly this, right? So that green strand, at least by wiggling it underneath this strand here, sorry, this is really hard to do uh, without you actually seeing my hand, but hopefully you understand what I'm saying is that this strand, this green strand and the green strand in the other picture are the same up to isotopy. You just wiggle the strand underneath the other, the black strand to the to the left. Um, so in this way, you can actually see that the diagrams are, even though they look a little bit different, actually the same up to isotopy. So this is one of the easiest relations to prove. Most of them are actually pretty straightforward, with the exception of one or two that require a little bit of maneuvering. But um, yeah, so the proof is very very straightforward, and just literally draw the pictures. Okay. Nicole, can I ask, uh, and what went into proving that Vn is the, uh, given by those partially trace diagrams in your earlier proposition? In the proposition? Mm -hmm. Yes. What is the question? So just what went into proving that? I think. Um, okay, so it's actually, so the, what we actually proved, there's, it's not that hard to see that Vn is actually the same as this. Um, just definitionally, and then you basically just, you use this fact to so use this, which you, I mean, I guess you can, you can also prove it, but it's not very hard to prove. So you prove this fact first, this, this isomorphism first, and then this really becomes here, the direct sum of HN plus M quotiented by HN or HM, HN plus M. And then you prove that this is equivalent to this. So you prove this first. So you, do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It's like a triangle. It's like you prove two equalities and then you get this. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. So that gives us an action of AQ. We want an action of AQ inverse as well. Um, 
I'm going to spend a little bit less time going through the diagrams, but the point is that you, we define it in an analogous way, right? Where D plus is defined to be this diagram, right? And the purple is supposed to uh, kind of tell you what's actually being modified from the original picture. Um, and why I star and phi star also has an action only in the case of a, uh, a Q. Sorry, I keep on forgetting the Qs for some reason. Um, do we have coefficients, right? So you'll note that the definition of A, it was just purely diagrams, no uh, constants hanging out in front. Uh, for AQ, we do have some constants. Those constants are there just so that the relations between them uh, in the AQT algebra hold, right? We want to replicate the relations from the algebraic formulation. And this is all we need in order to make that happen. So then, oh, no surprise, theorem. This uh, algebra A and this topological algebra A, sorry, AQ and AQ inverse, right? This topological, these uh, topological actions are correctly intertwined, right? And when I say correctly intertwined, remember that when I gave you the original definition of AQ, I told you, oh, or AQT, it's a copy of A, it's a copy of AQ inverse, plus three extra relations that relate, that intertwine the two copies. That's exactly what this is saying. It's just saying these uh, topological relations and these topological relations individually satisfy you know, the necessary relations, but they also intertwine with each other in the right way. Um, so consequently, they induce this uh, action of AQT on the direct sum of Vn. And this is just saying, basically, we're getting this polynomial representation that I told you at the beginning in terms of plethysms and sums and whatever else, purely topologically. Um, and again, the proof is just diagrammatic, right? Um, and then at the end, I also mentioned a couple of other operators, right? This operator N uh, that intertwined the two actions, right? And when I say intertwined, I mean in the sense that yi was like yi star of n, so it really conjugated one copy with the other. Um, and that operation topologically is actually very, very nice. So you have some coefficients in front, okay, whatever. Um, and then what you do is you take your diagram D, and then you swap in D every positive crossing with, ne with a negative crossing, and you invert every Q and T for Q inverse and T inverse. Or you substitute every Q and T with Q inverse and T inverse. And then you compose this D bar diagram with um, uh, a full twist on N plus N. So you basically just have your original diagram, you flip all the, all the, all the crossings, you flip the, the, the Qs and the Ts, and then you put a big fat full twist on top. And that's it. Um, and I'll leave it as an exercise. Um, but again, it's just a purely diagrammatic computation to show that this N intertwines A and A star in, this, in the sense that I'm writing here with all the operators. All the stars and all the non-starred elements uh, are obtained by a conjugation by N. So great. Um, yeah, OK, namely, there you go. So we can actually do a, a quick example, um, I guess. A, I didn't say, you know, you can do it on your own time, but I'll give you one example. Um, so for example, here, if you have, uh, if you want to show, which one am I showing? That N composed, doing this example. Uh, if I want to show that uh, phi composed with N uh, gives you phi star, you start with the diagram, you apply N, right? Which is just a full twist. And then you put a D bar with some coefficients, whatever. You apply phi. Phi takes that diagram and just adds this purple strand, right? Wraps it around the annulus right here and moves it back. Then you apply N again, you get some other crazy amount of coefficients. And all you're doing is when you do N, the D bar, if you do D bar twice, you get D itself, right? Because the crossings get flipped twice, the T and the Qs get inverted twice. So you just get the same thing. Um, and the full twist, as well. Oh, I should probably mention, yeah, n is an involution, right? n is an involution. Right. Um, so what that means is if you apply n here, really, the bars undo themselves, and you apply a full twist inverse to this, you exactly get um, the crossing here on the purple strands. Um, and magically, somehow, all these coefficients, and I say magically somehow, 
what I mean by that is by, you know, brute force by Matt and me, um, you put the right coefficients everywhere so that it all works out beautifully and you get exactly phi star back. Um, so it's uh, pretty magical that somehow everything works out exactly as you would like it. Questions? Sorry, I feel like I'm going a little fast, but maybe I'm just, maybe I'm just talking a lot. I also can't point, which is really hard. I feel like I'm pointing, but you guys can't see what I'm pointing at. Okay. Um, so let me, do I, how, how, wait, you said I end at how many, what, what time? Uh, 55 past. 55, okay, so I've had like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, good, good. I, I will get to the categorical component very, like soon, sorry. Let me just very quickly say, uh, and I won't spend too much time on this slide, that um, one of the nice uh, consequences of this topological formulation is just applications to symmetric functions. All right, so I told you that uh, Morton Aston um, constructed this uh, purely topological inter interpretation of uh, symmetric functions as closures of diagrams, as closures of braids, right? Um, so you can ask, well, can you realize kind of the same construction but instead of just looking at like v0, just like the usual symmetric functions, can we construct symmetric function analogs and not in each of the different levels of the vk's, right? These kind of higher order symmetric functions. Um, and basically, the answer is yes, um, right? And you can actually generalize their construction to just construct, for example, multiplication by ek to be this diagram where you take your, your strand here and you wrap it around the annulus, k K, K times, right? So it's just some really nice pictures um, or really nice closures that are not just acting on um, V0, right? So these diagrams are still partially open. They're not fully closed, right? That's the, that's the difference. Um, so it's kind of an, an extension of their work. And it just comes out as a, as a consequence of, of the operators that we defined, um, right? And so you don't, I mean, I gave you an example of EK. Um, but you can basically use these operators to construct pictures for, you know, di these dig path symmetric functions that show up in the, in the proof of the shuffle conjecture to construct how little wood polynomials to construct basically a whole slew of, of symmetric functions, um, which, you know, I haven't done this. Maybe it's true. Maybe it's not. But if you're interested in computations of symmetric functions and you hate plethism, maybe, maybe this is a, a good way of computing some of these things, you know, topology is great. You just kind of wiggle things around and everything works. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, okay. So um, that's it for the topological part. I'm going to move on to the categorical component and tell you how this all lifts uh, categorically. Any questions before I, I continue here? No, okay. Everyone's asleep or I'm just like crystal clear. It's great. I'm gonna pretend I'm crystal clear. So what is the categorical action? So just a couple of ingredients that we need. So in the topological and the algebraic picture, Q and T were just parameters. For us here categorically, Q is going to um, denote the grading, the internal grading on the category of zergal bimodules. And then T is going to denote the homological grading because we're going to be dealing with chain complexes and um, things of that sort. So the first ingredient that we're going to need is the notion of this categorified symmetrizer. So remember that in these definitions, in these diagrams, I told you that the one condent, the, this technical condition of absorbing uh, young idempotents or young symmetrizers from the bottom, those young symmetrizers were categorified by uh, Matt Hogenkamp and in previous work as certain chain complexes, right? So uh, this is just basically me telling you this is the categorical analog of these things. They correspond to certain chain complexes in terms of these uh, Zergel bimodules, right? So these are these are um, Zergel bimodules or bot Samuelsons, whatever. Um, um, okay. And the distinguishing point of these symmetrizers, or sorry, of these uh, uh, you know, categorified symmetrizers, is that if you tensor them with a uh, Bott-Samuelson or a Zergel bimodule on the left or on the right, actually, 
you get zero, right? So PN tensor BI, still zero. Our homotopy equivalent to zero, no homotopic. Um, and then uh, another thing, uh, another ingredient we're going to need is that one of the constructions of, of Matt um, in, in Matt's papers is basically a, a family of interesting endomorphisms, UI, uh, for PN, right? And they're interesting in the sense that they generate the cohomology ring of the endomorphism algebra of these, of these PNs. I'm not going to tell you exactly what it is, unfortunately. This is its own talk that, you know, just ask Matt. He's right there. He can tell you all about these things. Um, or read his papers, they're fantastic. Um, but all the, the only thing you need to know basically is they're categorical analogs, these are chain complexes, they satisfy some nice properties, and they come with these really nice endomorphisms that are interesting. Okay, um, and right, remember we had these QMs that were just multiples? Well, the multiples of the young idempotents categorically are basically just correspond to a cone of this diagram. So here the PNs are just these <clears throat> categorified symmetrizers and the QN is, con uh, is contained as the cone of basically the map UN. So this is why this UN plays a, a role, right? Because it gives you what the, cone, what, the, what the categorical QNs are. Okay, um, what other ingredients do we need? Well, in order to define our categorical VN, right, our vector space on which things are acting, we need to recall a construction um, that's very recent due to Gorski, Hogan, Kemp, and Wedrick. Um, it's in their paper called Derived Traces for Circle Categories. Um, <clears throat> and the idea is the following, right? So you can abstractly define this category as just having objects being bot Samuelsons in the category, in the category of uh, circle bimodules and whose morphisms are basically just Elias Williamson diagrams. So this is just saying, if you're familiar with the theory of zergo bimodules, you'll know that there's a diagrammatic interpretation of this where the morphisms are just string diagrams. So this is what I mean by EW diagrams. Um, and essentially, so here's a picture, but I'll draw you another one. All this is saying is you want to somehow realize the fact that you're taking your Hecke algebra and you're quotienting by commutators. How do you quotient by partial commutators in this case. Well, you do partial closures, right? Um, so here, what you want to think of is you want to think of this as being a cylinder. Okay, whatever. And you have some morphism. F, maybe here you have some, some B1, B2, Bj, whatever. And you have some morphism that's between tensor products of, um, of these uh, bot samuelsons Right? And what you want to say is, well, I would like it if whatever diagrams I have here, I would like some diagrams to be able to kind of slide through the back. So maybe this is some other morphism that I'm circling in red. And you want that diagram to be able to slide through the back, right? So maybe this is F. You have the same kind of picture here. But then you want that morphism, that red circle dot that represents a morphism to just kind of slide through the back. And the question is, well, you can on the one hand set this equal to each other, right? And say, oh, let's define a category such that this condition holds, right? That sliding a morphism on the, through the back of the cylinder equals the one sliding it on the other side. Okay. Um, but somehow that loses a lot of information because what you actually want is you don't want this to be equal you want this to be equivalent. And the point is that you want to keep track of these equivalences. You want to keep track of the higher homotopies that realize the, um, well, the equivalence between these two maps, right? And the way they do this in, uh, uh, the, the way that Gorski, Hogan, Kemp, and Wedrick do this is by realizing this as a DG model on, or a DG category, right? So this is what these purple bars are basically just, they're keeping track of these homotopies. Um, so this is what's called derived traces for circle, circle categories. Sorry. Okay. So then the point is that on this category is what we want to build our VN. Why? <clears throat> because this category of, uh, GHW basically is a categorification of these, um, 
quotient, right, of the Hecke algebra that I mentioned before, right? So the way we do this <coughs> is we take their category C, we consider the pre-triangulated whole. Again, these are all just technical conditions, so I apologize for not being a bit more explicit. Um, and within this pre-triangulated whole, we let Vn m, right, which is just the direct sum of this is equal to Vn, right, just so that we're in the same, in the same frame of mind here. Uh, we let Vn m be the full subcategory that consists of complexes and this pre-triangulated pre whole um, that are killed by Bi from below. So this condition of being killed by bot Samuelsons from below is equivalent, right? This is equivalent to the condition that our diagrams were basically kind of absorbing the PNs, right? It's somehow absorbing projectors and being killed by bot Samuelsons are very related. So these are related. So that's where we're seeing this condition. In the decategor in the topological version, it was absorption of symmetrizers in the categorical version that translates to dying by bot Samuelsons. Um, and I mentioned that we had these endomorphisms that were interesting, these UIs. We imposed the condition that they act normal homotopically. Again, these are all just technical conditions. Um, I apologize for not giving you a better intuitive uh, explanation of it. Um, and then very quickly, sorry, I realized I just was supposed to finish like a minute ago. Um, let me just tell you, the point of the story is that because by work of Rukier, right, if you take any braid diagram, you can interpret it or you can lift it, you can categorify it really is the word I'm looking for, as a chain complex over SBIM. Then this allows us to look at the diagrams that we constructed, right, which are really just braid diagrams, and directly translate them using Rukia complexes as chain complexes, or sorry, as functors uh, over this category VNM, right? So this is what, what I'm basically saying here is when I say we can read what the actions of the AQT algebra operators uh, are, um, it's basically you can read it by just reading it via Rukia complexes. Right, and that, that means is that this TI that I had defined before, um, right, the, the Hecke algebra generator becomes a functor where you're just basically taking your object in VNM, this category right here, we're talking about this is, this is this category that I just defined, and you take a chain complex in VNM and you tensor it by the corresponding Rukia complex. That's what TI is doing, right? TI inverse would be uh, tensoring with TI, the complex, the Rukia complex for TI inverse. D minus um, then becomes uh, a functor that is the identity on objects and inclusion on the morphism spaces. Then you have uh, D plus is a bit more interesting, right? So D plus takes this Rukia complex, right? Which is just, like I said, the representative of, of your diagram, uh, of your Bray diagram, um, and it tensors it. So why do I have two tensors? I just realized I didn't remember explain this. One of the underlying properties, right, of this, of this construction is that you have two compositions. You have horizontal and then you have vertical composition. Um, and all this is saying is, well, you have this horizontal notion of a tensor product, right, where this QN is this, this, um, this cone of UN we defined before, right? We take a tensor product, um, with just taking basically the identity ten, tensor of the chain complex. So this is really, this looks weird, but all I'm doing is basically I'm reading the diagram for D plus uh, from bottom to top and translating it to what the corresponding categorical formulation would be, right? Phi is exa exactly the same and so on. And basically, you can do this for the operators of AQ. You can do this for the operators of AQ inverse. Um, and of course, the point of the whole thing, the, the, the underlying theorem, is that they actually satisfy um, all the relations from the usual algebraic or topological uh, version uh, up to homotopy, right? So there is some, we're, we're not acting on the nose here, um, right? So relations like T1, D plus, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so relations like T1 equals this. Now this becomes, instead of an equality sign, this becomes up to homotopy. Um, 
the commutation relation here is really the only one that's interesting because this lives this lives as some sort of cone construction. Um, but the point is that when you decategorify all these things, you just get the topological and the algebraic picture back. Um, I should mention, and this is a key point, and then I'll, I'll stop talking, um, that although you can define the topological picture with T's and Q's hanging out in there, no problem. Categorically, if you really are going to say, well, what, what is being categorified by this, this, uh, this functor construction that I just explained, um, you're really just categorifying the topological or the algebraic picture uh, at t equals minus one. The reason for this is that when you decategorify, right, the t here was homological degree. That was how we were interpreting it. And that means that under the decategorification, it automatically gets sent to minus one. So really, categorically, the relations that you're recovering are not the ones that have t's, they just have q's. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, that's the only, the only note here in terms of the decategorification. And that is it. That's all I have to tell you. Thank you for staying an extra five minutes. All right, thanks, Nicole. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, so in, in, oh, sorry. Yeah, you should go, go, no, go, 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 no, 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 I don't really have a question. Okay, so in, in, in their work, uh, Gorski, Carlson and Melly, they define this BQT algebra, which is like a subalgebra of AQT, but at the same time contains AQT, so it's very weird. Yes. Do you have pictures for that? No, not yet. Not yet, that's the right answer. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. Uh, no, when we were actually uh, coming up with this, part of the question was, well, do we want to realize AQT or BQT? And it was a matter of choosing which one we wanted. Um, we haven't, I have, yeah, we haven't actually explicitly oh. written it out though. I think BQT is like more, more uh, natural uh, from the point of view of geometry. That's what you realize acting on Hilbert scheme. So maybe yeah, that's- no, Eugene what. asked me the exact same question. It's like, oh, well, what about BQT? You should do that one. I'm like, okay, yeah, man. <laughs> we will. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, So I had something to say about Eva's question earlier, like how to prove that this uh, topological thing was really isomorphic to Vn. Uh, it's actually kind of a fun exercise to do the same thing at uh, Q equals one with the symmetric group instead of the Heck algebra. Mm -hmm. So you draw pictures, you know, you draw you draw a permutation as a string diagram, and you decide, you know, you look at the symmetric group S n plus m. And you decide you're going to connect the top right m uh, strands to the bottom right m strands. And, um, and then place a symmetrizer on the bottom left. Just a symmetrizing idempotent on the bottom left. And then find a basis for that vector space. Well, you see it's indexed by, by pol polynomials in, in n variables. Anyway, it's kind of a fun exercise. I wanted to say that. And then the Heck algebra version is not so different. Cool, thanks. Any other questions or comments? Uh, well, yeah, first, uh, yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, really cool stuff. Um, I don't know if it's really quite, well, I guess there are a lot of questions behind it, but so you realized these V0 symmetric functions as like, you know, these closed braids, right? which I guess you have that puncture, so it's really like a torus link. It's like a thickened and annulus, then, like, like a thickened annulus okay. with some extra strands that are allowed to escape. Hmm. Those things, so like you realize NABLA is almost like, it's a full twist and some change, right? Mm -hmm. Which I was thinking if it was like on a torus, that'd be like a Dane twist on one of the cycles. And then the way you realize Nabla through Dunkel operators, the Daha, well, mm -hmm. the Daha has an SL2Z action mm -hmm. by almost inner automorphisms. It's like infinite series of elements. Um, and the series that gives you Nabla is also like a Dane twist, is, the, is that series of elements that give you the Dane twist. So um, I don't know, I just thought it was kind of the relationship mm. between um, Nabla and this thing twist is kind of, I don't know why it's true, but 
Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I'm particular to what you just told me. I don't, I don't know, but um, I mean, that's kind of the, the, what's interesting about this construction, I think, is that I mean, there's so many different directions that you could go, right? Mm -hmm. But just saying, all right, now I have these pictures. What can I do with them? And that's really where we're at right now. It's like, you know, we just, it's, it's the beginning of, of a lot of things, but we're hoping that um, because of, I mean, just how easy it is to, to play with them um, that we can, you know, build upon connections like what you just said and maybe, you know, do some cool stuff. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, it's a cool picture. Yeah, it's a really cool picture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting, very interesting framework, so. In terms of further directions, are you, is there any incentive to work outside of type A and have you guys thought about it at all? So this is interesting because people have asked me this before um, in other places that I've given this talk. Um, and somehow this, I mean, the original motivation was really kind of like, well, we have the shuffle conjecture, can we realize that categorically? Can we understand that statement, uh, some sort of categorical thing, uh, right? And the point is that somehow the, the operators that are showing up here, um, and in particular, like I mentioned this, this generalization, the, the rational shuffle conjecture, it um, is related to like kavana rosansky homology, and it, you know, it's related to elliptic Hall algebra, so somehow you're like, oh, let's go in that direction. And that was kind of our, our motivation is how many of these structures can we categorify? Um, but somehow all of this is in type A, from what I know. Uh, I don't know that there's a shuffle conjecture in other types. Maybe there is, but I, if it is, it's some sort of exclusively combinatorial construction. I've never heard of it being related to, you know, everything that the original story is related to. Um, I might be wrong, but I, I, I have never heard of it. So it's a great question, but I don't know what we would do with it in that situation. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Great. Uh, any other questions or comments? All right, let's uh, stop here then.